Okay, the time having arrived, I call this meeting of the Brockton School Committee to order, and I ask you to please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we open each school committee meeting with hearing of visitors. Uh, this is an opportunity for residents to be heard in front of the school committee, the superintendent, and the mayor. Uh, there is a three minute time limit uh, that we ask you to kindly observe. And uh, all matters uh, brought up during hearing of visitors are taken under advisement by the school committee. There will not be any immediate direct response. We do have several folks who have signed up this evening. Um, so the first one is, having trouble reading the handwriting of the first name. Yolanda, Yolanda DeFalco. Sorry, Yolanda. The DeFalco was very clear. The Yolanda I wasn't too sure about. Good evening, Mayor Carpenter, Superintendent Smith, and school committee members. My name is Yolanda DeFalco, and I'm speaking today about the Teaching Strategies Gold on behalf of the Brockton Education Association. In addition to my roles as BEA Vice President and Brockton Teacher, I am also a parent of two girls that will be attending Brockton Public Schools in just a few short years. Shortly after the year began, the BEA started receiving calls and emails from kindergarten teachers who were reporting deep concerns about a new evidence-based assessment tool called Teaching Strategies Gold that they're required to administer to their students. The BEA decided that the best way to get a handle on all of these issues was to schedule a special meeting for the teachers after school. We expected that maybe a dozen teachers would attend. With only five days noticed, we were shocked when 49 teachers came to Brockton High School after teaching a very long day with kindergarten and preschool and they stayed for over two hours to talk about the damage TS Gold is doing to our kindergarten program. We've never seen teachers so distressed and for so many reasons that included assessments are overwhelming. When do we have time to teach? When do our students have time to learn? Why are we uploading personal data on social and emotional behaviors? Where is this information going? How is it stored and who has access? Another major concern is the fact that there is already a great deal of testing that is completed at the kindergarten level. These include math and ELA benchmark assessments, star testing beginning in January, and informal report card assessments. For our SEI teachers and those ISEI teachers with English language learners, they are also administering a one-on-one -on -one weed access assessment that can last up to 45 minutes per student. These assessments, in addition to gold, are hindering quality instruction time. And while we are extremely grateful that Superintendent Smith, along with Central Administration, has, has worked alongside with Kim Gibson and a few other teachers in the district, um, they made some changes to the TSG requirements as well as giving the teachers a full day to upload. We know you did not have to do that. We very much appreciate that. However, the issue still remains that TS Gold and other assessments take time away from teaching. Additionally, the workload has and will continue to increase, especially when 10 domains instead of two are required. Gold states that its primary purposes are to observe and document development and learning, support, guide, and inform planning and instruction, identify children that may benefit from additional help, and to communicate with families. Reading that list sounds all-encompassing and inclusive of great teaching methods. Well, our teachers have already been doing all of the above and more. Brockton prides itself on its wonderful teaching staff. Our teachers observe and document development and learning. They use information in order to inform planning and instruction. They are always the first to identify the children that may benefit from additional help. Our teachers go out of their way to communicate with families and become partners. We do not need TSG to do the job for us. Let us teach, let them learn. As a mother, it concerns me that my girls will go to school where so much formal assessing takes place. 
to take so much time away from their learning. Teachers should be spending time conversing with my children, teaching them in small groups, reading stories, playing games, and letting them be kids, not assessing, observing, and clicking. Although TSG is a requirement, we should not be silent. We are asking the superintendent and school committee to join with the BEA in writing a letter to the department and Board of Elementary and Secondary Education protesting this grant requirement. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, our next visitor is D. Jones. Good evening, school committee members, Superintendent Smith, and Mayor Carpenter. My name is Dee Jones and I'm speaking on behalf of Monica Laguna and myself. We both have children who are in classrooms that are currently using te Teaching Strategies Gold and we're both veteran kindergarten teachers in the city. Although we're educators, we're here today speaking to you as concerned parents and constituents. As parents, these are our biggest concerns with TSG. Our children are being instructed in academic areas by non-certified paraprofessionals while the certified teachers are busy gathering and inputting data for TSG. These paraprofessionals have not received the intensive training on the common core standards in which they're being expected to teach our children. TSG prohibits our children from receiving quality interactions with their teachers that are critical for their learning and their development. It's a concern of mine that when my child got home from school the other day, I asked him if his teacher noticed that he had lost his front tooth. And his response was that she was too busy and she didn't notice. Losing a tooth at the age of five is a major milestone. And the fact that his teacher is too consumed with an assessment tool to make a personal connection with my son, it's upsetting. With the classroom teacher not directly instructing students and given remediation and or enrichment when needed, how is my child going to reach his potential and be prepared for future grade levels? Now let me take my parent hat off and put my teacher's hat on. I've seen the time that TSG has taken away from my students with only two objectives being observed this year. Next year, there'll be over 20 objectives that will be required to collect data on and input into the system. This year, it took us six hours to only input the checkpoint levels on two objectives without any documentation. This is equivalent to one whole school day. Do parents really want us to spend days away from their child inputting data versus instructing their child on kindergarten standards? I can easily share students' work and speak one-on-one -on -one with parents. It's called parent-teacher conferences. Educators know how to assess the whole child. We do it every day. We don't need gold to make people believe that this is assessing areas that we didn't assess before. Gold can limit what we can assess because it's so time consuming that we may have little time to assess other things that we need to find out about our students. As educated parents, we received the TSG printout last year from our children's teachers. The information given was overwhelming and confusing to both of us. It didn't give us any useful information that we didn't already know about our own children. Please, let the teachers teach and let my children learn. Thank you for listening and thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Heather McDonough. Good evening, Superintendent Smith, Mayor Carpenter, and school committee members. Thank you for allowing me this time to speak tonight. I am here before you as a kindergarten teacher, a resident of Brockton, and a parent of children who attend the Brockton Public Schools. As you are aware, there's a new state mandate initiative called TSG. As a kindergarten teacher, I am extremely frustrated by yet another cumbersome assessment. I speak for myself as well as my colleagues. This is just too much. TSG requires an enormous amount of observing, documenting, and reporting on each student. We are concerned about the time it takes away from our students. 
We are concerned about how this will disrupt the focus and flow of our classrooms. We are concerned about spending time collecting data that does not drive our instruction, nor does it coincide with our Common Core standards. We are concerned about the daunting task of well over 50 dimensions required for each checkpoint. We are concerned that our data doesn't benefit next year's teacher, just as the preschool data did not benefit us in our instruction this September. We are concerned about how this will affect our students' learning, as so much of our classroom time is spent compiling information for the objectives and dimensions of TSG and not teaching. We are concerned that our parents are not aware of the time this will be taking away from their child's instruction. We are concerned that we are losing valuable teaching time. We all entered teaching because we love kids and love to teach. We feel that TSG prevents us from doing this. As a kindergarten teacher, our goal is to get our students ready for the rigors of first grade. We are asking that we be allowed to do just that. Let us teach, let them learn. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, next up is Andrea Donnaroma. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Superintendent Smith, and school committee members. I'm here on a different topic. I would just like to take this time and to thank you as a school committee for having us have off the election day this school year. As a parent with three children in the school system, this is my 10th year as a parent in the system, and this is the best day that I've seen so far that we've had because the students were not in school. Their safety wasn't in question. We weren't worried about anything happening to from the littlest kids on up. Um, as a parent, I felt wonderful that I didn't have to be concerned about that. As a staff member who's worked in the school department before, I didn't have the anxiety of watching everybody walk in the door. I felt that my children were cared for and that their safety was put first because it is everybody's right to vote when they are registered, but the ch safety of our children need to come first, and I thank you for putting that ahead. That's it. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much to all the speakers. Uh, that uh, expires our list of uh, folks who signed up to be heard under hearing of visitors. Our next agenda item is the consent agenda. The consent agenda is the manner in which the school committee is able to handle routine business as a block to expedite the meeting. However, any school committee member may request that any individual item in the consent agenda be removed for individual discussion. So at this time, I'll ask if any members of the committee would like to remove any of the items from tonight's consent agenda. Ms. Sullivan. Uh, letter, B. letter B. Letter B. Is there anyone else? Okay, so I will entertain a motion on the consent agenda, absent item B. So moved. Second. I've got a motion made and properly seconded to approve the consent agenda, absent item B. All in favor? Opposed? That passes unanimously. Item B, Mrs. Sullivan. Um, I just wanted to point out, um, when the children and the teachers all go home for the summer, Brockton Community Schools is working hard all summer. Um, some of the programs that they put out there for the summer are, are just amazing. And there were some new ones this year. Um, they had the adult aquatics this year with youth swimming and diving, which is also going on. And sometimes I get people ask me about the special needs kids. They had a special needs aquatics program, which is currently going on now and it went on in the summer too. Okay, uh, in the summer they also had the Act One Scene One with 107 students participating. A year with frog and toad kids. Over 700 tickets were sold. Um, the preschool programs were very popular this summer. Kitty Day Fun Camp had a pilot program for special needs students also that they worked along with their peers and um, it helped the special needs kids. Um, Smart Start, Start Extended Day at the Unknown held 394 students. Um, the Brockton Act After Dark 
We ran Monday through Thursday nights, and the enrollment doubled from last year. And Jen Mack ran a summer fest, which was attended by over 6,000 to 7,000 visitors. Uh, that was held at the Brockton High Campus. They also had um, Chartwell's donated 450 lunches that were given away. And the Bimbo Bakers donated enough baked goods to fill 500 grocery bags with one bread item and one dessert item for families. So it was a pretty awesome summer for community schools. We're very pleased with uh, seeing, again, the additional uh, programs for our special needs students. And I know that's something that they continue to work on. Yeah. OK, any further discussion on item B? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Um, I make a motion to accept the minutes of the Community School Advisory Board meeting of September 10th, 2014. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Approved unanimously. So at this point of the meeting, I will turn the meeting over uh, for the report of the superintendent of schools to Superintendent Smith. Okay, um, good news. I'd like to uh, bring up our principal uh, Ryan Powers from the Baker School. We want to talk about our students and safety. And you know that this past fall, um, there was talk about uh, crossing guard positions that were cut. Uh, thankfully, we were able to bring back a number of those crossing guard positions because every day our custodial staff is out there making sure that our children get to and from school in a safe manner. Unfortunately, those of us that pick up the paper, listen to the news, have heard the mayor speak about this extensively. There have been issues with, again, driving, with pedestrians. We've had, obviously, loss of life, very serious situations. And I have actually had comments from a number of parents uh, talking about things that they're witnessing day in and day out with cars not paying attention to our children. Everybody's in a hurry to get somewhere. We had an incident back, I think, just over a month ago uh, where one of our custodians um, out on crossing guard duty, Miguel Rentis, ran into a very serious situation that was noticed by our school police, our administrative staff, and truly saved the life of one of our children. We would like to give him a commendation today, but I'd like uh, Mr. Powers to talk to us about the incident, and we'll invite Miguel to come up. Thank you, Superintendent Smith. Mr. Mayor, school committee members uh, in, the, in the general audience. Um, I do want to take this opportunity to recognize Mr. Rentis. Uh, about a month ago, uh, in his morning crossing guard duty, uh, Mr. Rentis had stepped out onto Quincy Street. And Quincy Street, like many of our streets in Brockton, is a very, very uh, heavily uh, traveled road. And unfortunately, cars uh, go very fast up and down Quincy Street uh, in spite of uh, Lieutenant Mills and his staff uh, being posted out there quite frequently. We even had the state police posted out there yesterday, and they were pulling over quite a number of cars. But in that morning, uh, Mr. Rentis had stepped out onto Quincy Street to stop traffic to cross a young female student, and a uh, car did not stop, and this young lady started to cross the road. And Mr. Rentis uh, truly went above and beyond, and he put himself in harm's way and stepped in front of this car uh, to prevent the young lady from getting um, hit by the car. Thankfully, the driver uh, realized what was happening and was able to slam his brakes on and stop mere inches from... Mr. Rentis, Officer Frizzell, who was posted out there uh, in her police cruiser, uh, witnessed this and she came in, uh, you know, very shaken up, and as was Mr. Rentis, and she told me that if it wasn't for him, uh, there's no doubt in her mind that this young lady would have been struck and killed. Um, so I, I, I took it upon myself, I contacted Mr. Thomas, and I just felt the right thing to do at the time was obviously to recognize Mr. Rentis. I, I know he, you know, exemplifies what a Brockton educator and a Brockton staff member is and, and truly put the students first. And he didn't have to do that, uh, but he, he didn't think twice about it. And he put himself in harm, harm's way for that young student. And uh, I just thought it was appropriate to recognize him for those actions. Very good. Comments? Do you want to make a comment before I bring him up? Okay. Mr. Rentis? Uh, Mr. Rentis, could you please come and join us? I'm going to give you this to hold. Come on. Right. 
Thank you Thank again. You. And again, this, this truly represents what goes on each and every day with our custodians who are crossing our students. Um, and we ask the public to, again, please understand that our children are on these streets every morning and every afternoon. So thank you again. I just want to add very quickly that uh, obviously this issue of pedestrian safety is forefront right now in the city. and. We are making every effort we can in engineering and education and enforcement, uh, but I guess uh, all of that can't substitute for what Mr. Rentis did to uh, protect that young lady. So I just want to personally extend my thanks to uh, Mr. Rentis also. Thank you, sir. All right, we're good. Go right ahead. On the next note, um, we did not have a school committee meeting as scheduled on November 5th. We were actually testifying before the Board of Education. But what I do want to bring to your attention is uh, on a very, very sad note, back two weeks ago, um, when school was just beginning on a Monday morning, uh, word came to uh, the Brockton Public Schools that one of our very valued employees and principal at the Downey School, Diane Goslin, had passed away. It was one of those days that it's very hard to prepare for something like that. Um, again, when I talk about a valued employee, Diane had been an educator for years. She started out in Milton. Fortunately, she came to Brockton. She has worked with numbers of students. When I would go to that building, she knew every student. She knew her staff. She obviously was, was a, a, a bright star in the Brockton Public Schools. So before I talk a little bit more about that and thank people involved that day, I would like to take a moment of silence for Diane, please. Thank you. When we talk about that day, one of the things I have said to everybody, it's very hard to plan, but I will tell you, your district does an excellent job with what we call crisis management. This is something we have had for over 20 years in the district. You have people that are trained, principals that get together for situations like this where we have to come together as staff, as administration, as a school community, and support those in need for any number of occasions. I, would, I really would be hard pressed to thank everybody involved that morning, but if you can picture 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, all of this unfolding with certainly over 700 students at a school, well over 100 staff members involved, and in a very short amount of time with our own administrative staff struggling with the news that had just come to us. We put together not only a crisis management team we were able to meet, at East Middle School, we had all of our adjustment counselors reporting. We brought numbers of staff members so we could enter the Downey School as a group to deal with, first of all, bringing teachers in to talk to them about what had happened, to prepare our teachers so that they could go back and talk to youngsters from kindergarten straight through fifth grade. Um, the support was tremendous from the adjustment counselors and staff working with teachers as they shared news with children, to messages to parents, a very, very caring community. I have to compliment, again, assistant principal John Kelly, who when I talk about step to the plate, John stepped to the plate even through his own grief. All of the staff members at the Downey School, uh, the tribute to Diane was tremendous in the coming days. Uh, when I walked into the funeral home uh, in Weymouth, one of the things I overheard, and I truly overheard this, was the gentleman running the funeral home said, I've never seen anything like this, the outpouring of support, not only from Brockton, but for the, the staff members that stayed there from the beginning to the end. So again, I can't thank the staff enough. Um, when I think of even some administrators, and, and I really didn't want to get into names, but Dennis Ginnich, Joe Pomfret, George Donovan, who came in as administrators that day, worked the lunches, worked the dismissals, stayed there till the very end so that John Kelly and his staff and the rest of us could deal with what we were dealing with. And, and so many of you, you know who you are. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And it really does let us all know, you know why we're part of the Brockton Public School family. We continue to support each other. So, thank you. Um, I'd also uh, like to, again, ask uh, Jessica Freeborn to give us an update on the happenings at Brockton High School. Take it away, Jess. Okay, well, um, last Monday, November 10th, um, many area veterans attended, in addition to our advanced concert band, JRTC, and seniors, um, to come and enjoy the Veterans Day Assembly. Um, I can say I was there. It was a beautiful assembly. Ms. Saffis' IB class put together an incredible and touching 
PowerPoint um, to remind everyone what the veterans mean to us. So it was a very nice assembly and it was just awesome for everyone to be able to see how important our veterans are and those who are serving currently. So that was wonderful. Um, last week at BHS we had a club fair where club members set up um, their little displays of what their clubs are all about um, and students gathered around and they were interacting with club members and um, people were already joining clubs, they were so excited, people were interested in everything happening at Brockton High and it was a great way for students to just go around and see everything we have to offer at our school so it was really nice to walk around in some of the clubs I didn't even know existed so it was really nice. Um, Okay, so tomorrow, November 19th, Term 1 report cards will be going home. Wow, the year is flying by, so yay, report cards. Um, this Friday, November 21st, 314 members of our senior class will be awarded the John and Abigail Adams Scholarships. Um, family and parents have been invited, as well as some sophomore classes who will watch as these seniors are receiving their awards. So congratulations to all those who will be receiving them. It's a great honor. So yay. Um, okay. Next Wednesday, November 26th, is a half day. And let's see. November 27th is Thanksgiving. It's our last home game at Brockton High. So don't miss your last chance to watch the football team and halftime show. And that's what's happening at Brockton High. Well, you certainly gave us a lot of openings. Um, you know, when you mention that number 314, Principal Boulder, isn't that the largest number we've ever had for Adams Scholarship winners? I mean, congratulations to our staff, our students, to families. That, that's quite an honor. And also, I believe on Friday, you're having College Day where staff members wear their college sweatshirts, T-shirts, wh whatever they have to, again, talk to our students about, about the opportunities that lay ahead for them. Okay, throw a quick sure, please. So I, I appreciated Jessica bringing up the uh, Veterans Day assembly on the 10th because uh, I had the privilege to be there. And I've been there for the last several years, but I actually brought my dad this year who's a World That's War II nice. veteran. So it was, uh, he was very moved. I know my friend Mr. Bath was there and many folks here in the room. And uh, if anyone has not seen that Veterans Day assembly, I would encourage you to, to make it next year because it's a really, really... Um, special recognition by our Brockton High students of, uh, of our veterans. So I, I, I just thought that was one of the highlights of the whole year for me to have a chance to be there and be part of that. Okay, and you mentioned, of course, the uh, Thanksgiving Day game, and I want to also congratulate our Brockton High School football team, our marching band. Uh, it was a great fall, although it was getting a little bit cold last Friday night. So we've enjoyed you out in the field. Uh, you've brought honor and pride to all of us every time you perform, and certainly on the athletic field with our football team. So thank you. OK, uh, moving on to uh, East Middle School Arts. We have here strategy. And I want to remind the committee that initially we started to talk about East Middle School as an arts academy. And with difficult budgets, uh, with a number of things that we're facing, while our hope is still high as we look to grants, as we, as we look to other opportunities for uh, East to one day be an arts academy. One of the things we have been able to focus on is integrating arts in the curriculum as a strategy to work with our youngsters. It's high interest. There have been some, we might, I'm, I'm calling them baby steps, but we are moving in that direction. I'd like to uh, invite Principal uh, Kelly Silva, uh, Lisa Villani, who is our new arts facilitator. Yes, we stole her from South Middle School to join uh, East Middle School at this time. And uh, they will actually do a short presentation. Uh, Celeste Hogue is here and Dennis Skinnage also. And they will talk to you about what's happening uh, at East to give you an update on this.
Hopefully I know how to use the clicker. That's the mural, right? That's east. That's the mural. So good evening. I'm excited to share with you um, something that we're doing at East Middle School as part of our school redesign. Um, I know some of you know that three years ago we were awarded a school redesign grant and we are now in year three. Um, in addition to peers and learning teams to increase teacher collaboration, um, programs to address the unique needs of our students, um, and our STEAM electives, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, we decided to increase the A in STEAM and um, use arts integration as a key strategy at East Middle School. Um, I know that some of you, I presented in front of some of you, but not many of you, and I think it's important for you to know a little bit about our school. Um, last year, at the end of the year, um, Lisa Badalino, Dean Badalino of Virginia State University, um, said, hey, I'll create like a little video for you um, to introduce your school. So I said, okay, I was expecting a little video. And then the people that were doing the video said, um, it's like a three-part story. And I know what I did in my interview, I didn't know what everybody else did, so I said, what do you mean a three-part video? So I'd like to show you um, this video, and hopefully the sound will work. Um, just to kind of introduce you to East Middle School.
school is a family. We have everybody going. If we walk through this front door, we're always middle school. All the kids are always. The collaboration between the entire staff has created one school. But we're a unit. I mean, it's not really clicky. All the, all the teachers talk to each other. Everyone's high by. All the kids know the teachers. We're teaching all the kids, no matter what the grade is. I mean, it's just really, everyone's here to help each other. It's positive. We enjoy our job. We have each other's backs. It's a family. We have students from a lot of different backgrounds and cultures. And, um, um, native languages, and um, we do a lot of activities like talent show, like dances, like um, you know, things that they do at lunch, um, and electives where everybody's working together and we all feel a part of it. Everything we do, we do together. Doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter what you look like, doesn't matter who your parents are. When you're like here, we are all one person. I've been really, really impressed since my son started here, especially with the uh, administration of Principal Kelly Silver is one of the most exceptional principals I've ever come across. They have gone above and beyond meeting any expectations that I could have ever even imagined here at the school. Don't sleep on your middle school. I bet. Don't sleep on your because we are these. We are one school. It would be. 
be family. I think it, because it goes beyond building a culture. You know, everyone talks about, even in the textbooks, it talks about how to build the culture of a school. But we are a family, which means, yes, we have dedicated people, but we really care about one another, and we really look out for one another. And I think that's what the difference is. East West will always be their home. We will always be here to support them. And that's why we are a family. It, it never ends. You can, you can do things. You can have actions, but it's what's in your heart that actually, that makes the difference. So that is my family and all my family. A lot of my family members are back here, even the gentleman that's the ripe old age of 26. <laughs> So, now that you've met us, we're going to talk about arts integration. So, why arts integration? Um, there's a large um, body of research that states that arts integration um, addresses multiple intellig intelligences. It um, better prepares the students for the rigorous Common Core standards. And it assists um, students with developing 21st century critical thinkers. And I think everyone in Brockton knows it's not enough to teach our kids how to compete. Our kids need to be the competition. So why art integration for East Middle School? So research states that um, a lot of these strategies have been proven to meet um, a distinct population of students, special needs, um, ELLs, um, low income, gifted and talented, and a lot of the East Middle School students fall into one or more of these categories. So, um, as you can see from um, the, these slides, we have a high population of low-income students, um, LEP students, and students with disabilities. So, what is art integration? And there are several definitions, and while I wish I could come up with a creative one, I can't, um, but this is the one that we're using from the Kennedy Center. Um, it's arts integration is an approach to teaching in which students construct and demonstrate understanding through an art form. Teachers engage students in a creative process by connecting an art form to their content area. So arts integration is not an arts class. It's not a core art class. It's an approach um, to teaching. So here are some of the strategies that um, the teachers at East Middle School are using. And as you can see at the bottom, arts integration has, is now a part of our toolbox. Um, there are certain strategies I see, I think, I wonder. What makes you say that? Um, a tableau where kids um, use their bodies to act out a scene. Um, doctor expert, reader's theater. So here are some examples of teachers engaging students in the creative process by connecting an art form to their content area and students constructing and demonstrating understanding through an art form. So this is a math lesson where a student, the students had to create a comic strip to demonstrate um, one of the rules of exponents. And as you can see, there's the exponent king. In science, um, one of our teachers um, every year takes her class and transforms it into a cell. And there's things hanging everywhere, and it really looks like a cell. And the students have to... Um, they're assigned a part of the cell, and, and through dr dramatization, they act out their function. And even if like, you happen to stop by, she'll like, kind of integrate you into um, the lesson, too. That's why I try not to stop by, because I'm afraid of what she'd make me be. <laughs> and this is a grade 6 ELA class, and this is a tableau. So um, this um, group of students were illustrating the main character, how the main character in Old Yellow would behave if it had a terrifying encounter with a bear. So as you can see, it's pretty good depiction of what it would look like. And what's great about the tableau is not only are students acting out the scene, all the other students are looking at them, analyzing it, asking questions, and answering questions. So if you do a tableau before a writing assignment, rather than having students jot down their ideas and, and brainstorm, if a student's acting out, um, the tableau, all the questions that you would ask or have them write down, if they're acting it out, if they're seeing it themselves, 
it has it, it helps them with their writing and students um, writing has improved because of it um, all of our teachers use this um, this is an example from one of our substantially separate classes it's I see I think I wonder um, and it's on the earth's crust and you can see the picture there where she created an, um, a picture using food and one of the students says I think this is a picture of I think the crust of an earth or the earth's crust and he was right so while arts integration has is great um, it's hard work and so um, we know that in order to do anything right there needs to be a lot of professional development involved so we've had um, full day um, in-service professional development opportunities that all staff members participated in um, even the leadership team we also have a um, group of teachers who are using our train the trainer model where they are having full day PD every month once a month and they are bringing it back to their um, teammates and of course we have our arts facilitator Lisa Villani who um, provides PD um, throughout the whole um, year so in addition to integrating the arts into the curriculum we want to make sure that the students experience the arts so we have our electives and we have more arts based electives this year um, drama cartooning and anime East Instagram where that picture is compassion is um, we also have performances as you can see on the bottom um, that's Sarah Kearley and uh, Mr. Manwelli who's our music teacher um, performing uh, we've had jazz performances art exhibits but one of my favorite things is the instrument lessons um, in Brockton instrument lessons are offered in the third grade what we were finding is a lot of our students were coming from other countries that had musical talent and we didn't discover it until the talent show at the end of the year so um, anybody that knows Mr. Macrina he will do anything to put an instrument in a child's hand and he did and he worked with us with scheduling and resources and we have so many students this year taking instrument lessons and our band has moved from like a two-man band to um, double digits and, and it's and it's wonderful so it's not enough for me to get up here and tell you about um, arts integration we have some quotes from some teachers and hopefully the teachers won't a lot of them wrote quote had you know gave me quotes and hope they don't take offense if I didn't use it um, implementing the arts into my curriculum seemed like a seemed daunting to me at first I'm not very artistic and I felt overwhelmed at covering my curriculum while still being able to dedicate time to the arts after spending time brainstorming ways to get the arts into my curriculum I realized that arts don't need to be a standalone project they can be a vehicle to deliver my curriculum and you don't need me to read all of them to you but um, a lot of our ESL teachers um, have found that it is assisting with the reading writing speaking and listening for our English language learners and one of the good things too is it's not about getting the right answer it's about um, using artistic strategies to help them discover the correct answer and you know when you talk about the arts it's not just about um, the research arts you know it, it, it increases um, engagement and one of the teachers said my my students are more passionate about their learning and I'm more passionate about my teaching so here are what our students are saying um, a lot of them are saying it's helping because they're visual learners um, a lot of them are saying it's helpful because they get to see things from different perspectives um, in science class we're learning about the metric system and I didn't understand it but after the arts came in I got it instantly now things are easier for me to understand and I have a better way I have a better understanding of the things we are learning because I'm I'm having fun doing it while doing arts activities I have learned from the, my classmates and gained ideas from them that have helped me helped my confidence when I write essays on my own and that is probably one of the the best um, things that a kid could say because that is exactly why we are um, doing the arts integration so you can't we can't really 
tell you about it because that's about the art, so you have to um, participate yourself. So really quickly, this is, I see, I think, I wonder. And in your packet, on the back, this is a picture. And what do you see? What do you think? What does it make you wonder? Right so behind the PowerPoint, you yes. should have a piece of paper that says, I see, I think, I wonder. So we were hoping that some of you would participate in this activity. Because <laughs> it's about the arts and experiencing this. I know Mr. Minichello is very excited about this. <laughs> What do you see? I see a blanket tree. Okay. <laughs> I think somebody's probably looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder how long they've been looking. <laughs> I, see a, um, I see a show called Ridiculousness. <laughs> <laughs> and someone that just went flying over the, uh, flying through the woods into the bushes. <laughs> Bike that has been here a long time. Through into or through the tree. Uh -huh. Anyone else? I see a tree that they a bike. <laughs> <laughs> so, what this is is a, a boy went to war in 1914 and left his bike chained to a tree. Um, he never came home, and the family left the bike there as a memorial to the fallen soldier. That is the end of the presentation, but I have to thank um, some people, Laurie Silva, Richard Bath, Sarah Richards, Carrie Kopp, um, everyone at Bridgewater State University, because without them, none of this would be possible. And I have to thank um, my staff, because they've been patient with me, and they, they trust me, um, and the arts are working at East Middle School. Any questions? Yes. How long have you been implementing this program? This is um, new this year. So um, we started at the end of last year, just uh -huh. some you know basic strategies, but really um, fully implementing it in September. Well, it's this is probably a premature question, but have you seen this type of philosophy uh, translate into um, better behaviors and less discipline issues? Yes, what suspensions and things like that? Well, student engagement definitely. Um, the kids, I mean, if the kids want to be there, mm -hmm. um, then they're less likely to misbehave in classroom management. One of the quotes one of the kids said is, um, "Now that we have the arts, I'm not bored, and I actually pay attention to the teacher." So, um, you know, that's helped. It's helped with students writing. It's helped with them thinking things through, you know, because you're asking them questions and they know, oh no, it's not just about, you know, her telling me the answer, I have to think about this. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of things. Um, with the special ed kids, it's worked um, tremendously. We have a high ASD population and um, it's really working with them and to see um, um, students on the spectrum acting things out, um, different scenarios is, is, is amazing. I really like what you said about you know, not one of the children's quotes, it wasn't about finding the right answer, it was discovering the correct answer. You know, and I think in the discovery piece is really key. So this is really exciting, and I hope you'll share your progress as, as we get towards the end of the school year, or maybe, you know, report back and let us know how it's going, because I think this is really exciting. Thank you. One of the things that we had talked about, you know, back when this originally started was, and I was picturing, you know, a big sign, you know, Welcome to East Arts Academy. And while we're not quite there, I mean, there's a lot that needs to happen, you know, I think they've done an excellent job with the staff and all the mandates that the staff have out there in every one of our schools. I think, again, uh, Principal Silva and her staff have coined this as a strategy, something in your toolbox, things that we're able to see with research. You know, it is motivating kids. Mm -hmm. We'll continue to provide professional development with staff. We're hoping, again, we've got Laurie Silver out there looking for grant money, and, and it's very much driven by a budget. There, there were great ideas when we sat brainstorming last year of things we'd like to bring. We were picturing a TV studio, a real feeder program to Brockton High School for kids that want to choose to come to East because they want to be involved in the arts. So there's a lot more to this. Uh, it's a great start, 
and we'll continue to try to support this. And I, I do have to say, you know, in all honesty, we're out there looking at facilities. We all know this. We did a facility tour a couple of weeks ago. We're looking at, you know, stretched budget, you know, classrooms filled with kids. And so I, I just compliment you with all of this happening around you that we continue to, to move forward with, uh, with the arts integration. Just one more comment, if I may. Um, the middle school age group, you know, is it, I think it's a time my own experiences with my own kids, you can start to lose them. They start becoming demotivated with, with school. And I think if you can capture them at this age, I think it really sets them up for success as they move to, to the high school and graduation into college. So if you can keep them engaged and keep them motivated through sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, I, I think it's going to be quite a success for these kids going forward. And I think that's why many of us um, selected the middle school level, because mm -hmm. a lot of people said, why? It's because it, it, it is that, that age group where you can really, really make a difference yeah, absolutely. Um, in the kids' lives. Yeah. So. Great. Thanks for sharing this. Thank you. I'd also like to thank um, Lori Silva and um, Mayor Carpenter and also uh, Bob Buckley, because I know that they were able to <laughs> find some funding for some of the equipment and technology. Um, Absolutely, that was fantastic. I mean, Lori Silver is very dogged. She doesn't take no for an answer, so <laughs> she uh, she worked well with the mayor's office. So um, thank you. <laughs> and the mayor can come and use the equipment anytime he wants. <laughs> <laughs> Karaoke or? <laughs> Oh, we could do that. There is radio theater. Radio theater is an odd strategy. Yes, yes. There you go. Yeah, the American teacher radio showed us some of the kids. <laughs> there that's, we go. That's right. I forgot about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we get lights back? Oh, all right. So we're going to keep the lights off. Oh, we're going to be in the candlelight here to <laughs> to introduce the next. Um. So again, we presented our strategic plan uh, to you back in uh, August. Many of you worked obviously alongside us all of last year with our entry and transition planning, developing into our strategic plan. I told you I would continue to keep you updated. One of the things I want to thank a number of people out there and school committee members included, um, just the past couple of days, we have been working with uh, the U.S. Education Delivery Institute, EDI, out of Washington, D.C., and we were actually chosen by the DESE to have this opportunity where a group comes in from this uh, institute and works with us to make sure, and you know how many times I've said to you that we don't want the strategic plan to just be a document. We want it to be a living document. We want to make sure there's implementation. As you have reminded me, we need to have timelines. We need to be able to show you the, uh, the progress that we're making. So we've worked the past couple of days. We had a debriefing today for about two hours talking about what our next steps are to continue to work on our strategic plan. So what I wanted to have tonight was I wanted uh, June Saber McGuire to share with you uh, some of the things we're doing right now uh, at the school level, uh, implementing our strategic plan. But as luck would have it, June cannot speak tonight. She has <laughs> laryngitis. So Deputy Superintendent Barry is going to... Uh, I'm speaking to, for Mrs. Saber McGuire. Her and carry this through. So I'm going to move so you can talk to us a little bit about our. <laughs> um, if I don't say what she's hoping I will say, you'll hear kind of a squeak over there in the corner. But um, okay, so what you're actually looking at is you're looking at um, a new school improvement plan that was actually uh, developed by. Um, June at the Huntington and also um, Cliff at, at, at West Middle School. There is one, one, um, uh, one bonus in having people working two positions. It's, it's that some of the things that we are looking to do district-wide, we have that opportunity to allow um, both June and Cliff who are in two positions to bring it back to their schools and actually try it on. So what you're looking at is you're looking at a revised school improvement plan. Um, our last school improvement plan was um, a, had a two-year duration, so it was time to take a look at revising our plan 
um, and we felt that one of the things that we would do is take a look at the plan and link it um, very, very explicitly with the district strategic plan. So you actually have in front of you the work of the Huntington, um, and you can see that even stylistically, the school improvement plan itself looks very much like the district strategic plan. Um, you'll see on the top of the page that instructional excellence, the vision, as well as the mission of the Brockton Public Schools is actually situated front and center at, at, um, within the plan. At the Huntington School, they, they worked a lot in their own vision and mission, and all of our schools spent a lot of time thinking about what their school-based vision and mission would be. So we've got that school-based vision and mission and, and, and how it relates to the district vision and mission as well. So that's the cover page. Don't go too fast. Okay. Okay, so then you see the areas of focus for the district strategic objectives. The district strategic plan is organized in three, in, in three um, focus areas. Instructional ex excellence, supportive environment, and community engagement. The expectation with this new template is that um, schools are going to develop their own school-based action steps within those three focus areas. You then see a school-based theory of action, and again, those three focus areas are right there. Instructional excellence, supportive environment, and community engagement. That way, the school-based plan mirrors the district plan as well. Okay. Within that first focus area of instructional excellence, you will see that the Huntington School actually used some of their own data and said, what are some district strategic objectives that we should um, make sure that we focus on as a school? And also, what are some district strategic initiatives that are reflective of the work that we should be doing as a school community? From there, you take the district strategic initiative and you look at what are some school-based action steps that the school can employ to get where the school needs to be. Now, some of the questions that we've had related to the district strategic plan are, who, you know, who's going to actually implement, um, what are they going to be doing, and how often are they going to be um, actually doing, who, who's monitoring the work. So the, the, the plan itself has, has, a, has an area within the plan that says what, by whom, and how often. And that's something that allows school-based leadership teams to talk about the um, areas that they need to put in place to monitor their plan. Now within instructional excellence, you see that there is a focus on ELA. There is also a focus on math. And then one on science. So it's pulling from the strategic initiatives within the district plan, but then saying, as a school, what does that look like for us? And also, as a school, how do we monitor it and what kind of data sets do we use? Okay. Okay, so that next uh, focus area, supportive environments. This is an opportunity for our schools to think about what they do um, in the non-academic realm for students. We did before um, in the old school improvement plan, we had a goal that was related to um, school culture and, and school support. So we always had this, this lens, this focus, but it's an intentional um, mirroring of the school, of the district strategic plan. So again, you see a district strategic objective that the school is committed to fulfilling. There are some data sets that the school will use, and then a whole series of action steps which are also delineated by who's monitoring, what are they looking at, and how frequently are they monitoring. And lastly, the third focus is on community engagement. The school is taking the district focus and they're saying, um, as a school community, what, what, what do we look like? And you can see that we're, that's a bit of a work in progress. Um, but there are some real strong action steps within the school, again, monitored by specific individuals um, so that they are taking the district plan and they are um, really employing pieces of the district plan within their school. 
Um, I, I will tell you too, uh, Dr. Murray couldn't be here tonight, but I know that he has also used the template um, and that he's been able to talk about how it seems to be, um, a, is he here? Is he? I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, that, that he is also employing the template and finding um, it to be a useful exercise with his instructional leadership team. You have a voice. Is there anything you would like to? No. Okay. <laughs> no, actually, we found it to be very helpful and very user friendly. June's team did a great job, and it's really allowed us to incorporate from a school specific standpoint the things that we feel are important, but integrate it, kind of mesh it create a synergy with the district school. So it's made something that our teachers can really can kind of you know buy into and believe in. And at the same time, it really aligns beautifully with the, uh, the superintendent, all the work that the transition team did, and all the folks that helped with that. So I, I think it's compared to some of the other um, things that we've had in the past, it seems to be really a great step forward. Mm -hmm. We're almost done. <laughs> uh, the building level, the site level, how is this um, incorporated? Sort of on a daily basis or presented to the staff going forward. Are you talking about the school improvement plan? Yeah. So the, the school improvement plan template has not yet been shared with all schools. Um, because our hope was that we were going to actually have a couple of schools try it and then go from there. But um, in, in years past, when we've actually developed a school improvement plan template, um, schools often work together because um, what you'll find is that one area of focus for one school is an area of focus for another. And so they are working with their instructional leadership teams, but also collaborating with one another to get the plan done. But this specific template has really um, only been shared um, in a small way at this point. As a matter of fact, with EDI, one of, the, one of the things they really wanted to know and questioned us quite extensively on was how does the district improvement plan translate to accountability at the site level, at the school level. And I think this is a fantastic tool for the schools to use to make sure that our district improvement plan aligns with what's going on in the schools. Right. Um, the, the piece that's missing um, that we are finishing up is the actual data page that each school will have. Um, we will give the schools various data sets so that they can sit and make decisions about their areas of focus, what makes sense for their school. Um, and we're also talking about a data protocol, which really is just a series of questions that says, when you sit with your instructional leadership team and you're looking at that district plan and you're saying, what should we focus on as a school, what kinds of questions are we asking ourselves about about um, the best areas of focus for our kids and our schools. So we're definitely getting there. And you know, in, in debriefing with them this afternoon, there was a real recognition of where we are and also um, really how much capacity we have as a district um, to, to um, you know, keep going. So um, they're actually going to come back. EDI will be coming back. They'll probably speak to school committee at mm -hmm. some point soon. Mm -hmm. um, but after today, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, how they can support our district um, in really helping us to implement the plan in the best ways possible. How is the community and parents involved in this, in this particular, um, like the Huntington? How are they involved in this, in the creation of this improvement plan? School mm -hmm. Speak up a little louder. I know. <laughs> <laughs> they have to. Okay. 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 So they're involved in the process. Okay. <laughs> Won't make you answer any more questions. <laughs> Okay, we'll continue to keep you updated. Um, I know during our retreat, we'll be talking about the uh, superintendent's goals, which will relate to the district improvement plan. Um, and we'll be talking about that on December 6th. And again, you'll, you'll see that same thread through the goals uh, at the district level, school level. Uh, and the thing that I, I will have to tell you today, um, as I said, the, the 
committee has been hard at work. Um, I want to thank Deputy Superintendent Barry, who was complimented by the staff from EDI for setting this up, for making sure everybody was there to discuss. They were very, very pleased to work with our district. And one of the things we talked about today was when I looked down the table at the years of service of your executive team, your leadership, uh, all of your principals who weren't necessarily there today, but when you think about the district, you are well poised right now with this strategic plan for it to be exactly what we want it to be. It's not, it shouldn't change with every superintendent. It should live in the district. And if we do it right this time, if we make sure that we have our district improvement plan, we continue to look at it, we share with you when we're making gains, we take a step back if we need to change things, but it's something that again can continue you know, through superintendents, et cetera. And one of the things I said, and I wanna say it publicly, is your opportunity is great. You have such great leadership. And I'm not talking the superintendent, I'm talking about your executive team. I'm talking about your district department head, your principals, your leaders who are, are doing this work day in and day out. So this is a real opportunity for the district. Um, the debriefing today I thought was excellent. It was really a look into our school district. There were a lot of strengths and there were areas that we need to work on. So we welcome this challenge and we'll continue to, to report to you about the progress. Right. Questions? Thank you. That was a very nice collaborative presentation. Um, any qu further questions from the committee? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Teaching let, Strategies Gold Update. Let me move on to Teaching Strategies Gold Update. And I want to thank everybody that presented during the hearing of visitors this evening. Um, our kindergarten teachers, you're terrific. Um, if I've ever had a bad day, the best thing that I can do for myself is get out and see a kindergarten class. Um, it's amazing what goes on in, in a kindergarten class with our, our learners that are there for many, many times it's their first opportunity in the Brockton Public Schools. Um, when you look at the teaching strategies gold, one of the things that came across loud and clear is our teachers know how to teach best. They know how to spend time with our youngsters. They're dealing with social emotional issues of our students coming to school for the first time. When we actually took this project on and piloted the pro project, it really did translate into over $600,000 for our district. Um, we have hired paraprofessionals to work with our kindergarten teachers in the classroom. I'll remind everybody about the large class sizes we have in our kindergarten classrooms. And one of the things that we again did, and it was very, very informative. I had certainly been hearing the rumblings for a while. And one of the things we did just about a month ago, we brought teachers in, teachers that piloted last year, we brought district administration, we sat with Kim Gibson in the union, and we came up with, at this point, a chance to take a look, to take a look at what is feasible for us to do. We did take this money. There are some things that are expected by the district, but um, I assure everybody that we will continue to look at this to make sure that your main goal and your priority is to be able to teach those children every day. So, Deputy Superintendent Barry, you want to talk about this? Well, and we'll things that were that was that was in the packet um, you know uh, we had that meeting and and um, although we did pilot um, within the district and although teaching strategies gold was something that um, was in all of the preschools um, until we actually brought it to scale, I, I think that it was when we brought it to scale, we really got a sense for what the issues would be. Um, you know, piloting something in small pockets, I, I don't think um, really prepared us. And so having that meeting with Kim and the others was was hugely beneficial. Um, and when we when we met to discuss um, the problems that teachers were having or the concerns that they had, um, our main objective was really to say, we, um, this is a grant requirement. This is part of the um, requirement related to um, accepting the quality full day kindergarten grant money. And as Superintendent Smith said, that's how we pay for our paraprofessionals in kindergarten. So how do we comply with the grant requirement, but also maintain um, a level of response to teachers who, who are saying all of the things that we want them to say? This is getting in the way of our instruction, and, and that's a problem. We also had teachers who, because they're so committed to their instruction um, they were taking everything home on the weekends and they were doing it then um, that's not not what we wanted not what we intended so um, listening to um, teachers concerns and and really being able to say how do we comply with this mandate um, 
and still, you know, in a way that's responsive to teachers. So we did we did give teachers additional time um, because we had that first checkpoint where everything, all of the data has to be in by the 21st. Um, and again, it's not a Brockton requirement, it's a state requirement. Um, and then also thinking about um, ratings. The state is only looking for ratings, so there's a whole piece on uploading evidence, videos, anecdotal notes, all of that. And we heard from teachers who said, we already have all that information and we're really duplicating efforts. So. <clears throat> We said if the ratings are all that the state is requiring, that's all we're going to require as well. Um, if there's one thing that really came out of that meeting, and I hope that you know that it was that it was evident, um, we are absolutely committed to ongoing conversations with teachers, um, with the BEA, to say. Um, if we're going to um, continue to receive full day kindergarten grant funds, how do we as a district make sure that teachers are supported um, in, in what they do every day? How are we going to be responsive to the concerns that they brought to our attention? Um, so one thing was to give them additional time. It's going to have to be something that we continue to look at. And the other thing is just making sure that we are maintaining that bare minimum requirement and that we're really not going above and beyond. I will tell you that um, this state mandate was in response to um, many districts across the state that do not have early indicators for success and that is not the case in Brockton. We have formative assessment measures at the kindergarten level and we have for quite some time. So Brockton is almost paying the price for what other districts do not have. And we have to ask ourselves this question, if we're going to continue to receive the quality full day kindergarten grant funds, these are some of the things that are going to come with that. The other piece of correspondence um, that you have is a letter to families. We heard from parents that were very concerned about videos being uploaded, where do they go, that kind of thing. We felt very strongly that we weren't going to employ those, those, kinds, of, those kinds of things. And what we said was, if we're just going to focus on ratings, we don't need that kind of data uploaded into the system. We also felt strongly that teachers don't need to be the ones answering all these questions about this assessment. So you actually see a letter from me that's encouraging parents to call me. Um, it's another thing on teachers' plates that, that they just simply don't need to be dealing with right now. I will tell you that in listening to teachers um, during the hearing of visitors, I don't disagree with anything that was said, um, but it's that how do we comply with this mandate? How do we continue to receive the grant funds and benefit from the grant funds and do what we need to do in order to, to continue to receive that funding? Um, it was funny, Friday we were at an urban superintendent's meeting and someone from the state said, so what's going on? Anything that I should, you know, hear a little bit more about? So I said, yeah. So we talked a lot about Teaching Strategies Gold. And, and I don't know, maybe like 10 minutes later, um, <laughs> it was the wrong day to ask that question. Um, he was kind of edging away from, from, the <laughs> from the seat. Definitely sorry that he asked, but I think that Folks at the state level need to know that this is a huge undertaking and that there are districts that already have systems in place so they're not seeing the benefit. Um, and that is something that we expressed loud and clear when we were there last week. But. Every year we receive um, the quality full day kindergarten grant. And so it's ev this year we receive $605,000. Is, is it like grant cycled though? Is there an RFR or like an RFP that comes out? Right. And we, we have to write the grant every year. Brockton is uh, sort of an automatic recipient. The funds have diminished quite a bit. Um, and I will tell you, I mean, years ago, the quality full day kindergarten grant was the grant that we utilized to get full day kindergarten across the district when we didn't have it. Um, yeah. The grant funds have diminished. The requirements have, 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 great, have um, become greater. If you recall, um, we talked about NAEYC um, last year and the year before, and we brought the binders of evidence. Um, that is also a quality full day kindergarten um, requirement. We have to work on NAEYC. That's another thing that I don't necessarily see that direct connection to classroom and the direct benefit to kids, but we're trying to comply with that grant because our fiscal situation is such that it would be hard to say what would we then do. Um, it's the state. It's Desi. It's Desi there. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm just trying to kind of think through if this is like an annual RFR 
you know, an RFP that it's an entitlement for us, but yep. is there anybody who's applying annually? I mean, if they're if they're releasing the money annually versus say mm -hmm. like a three year grant cycle or a five year grant cycle, you know, there may be opportunity for multiple people, including teachers, union members, yeah. administrators, and school committee members, mm -hmm. to kind of contribute some thoughts about how maybe the the funding could, you know, the funding requirements could mm -hmm. be adjusted. You know where we could use some of our our measures as substitutes for participation right. in gold or or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you know I don't know. If, you know just knowing that grants like if they cycle three years, then it's like every three years you have an opportunity to provide that kind of feedback mm -hmm. with some hopeful, you know, action behind it. Right. I, is this one of those things where um, where it's it's a I'm, not I'm, worth the worth the case or. Are there opportunities, or is I, there I, I always think it's worth. I mean, I, I definitely think it's worth the case. I mean, you know, I, um, I, I do see early evidence, maybe, of some progress. Um, when we were at the meeting at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, um, uh, Julianne Andre, our early literacy coordinator, was at um, a kindergarten assessment meeting um, because it's early education and care where this falls under, and for the first time in all the time that we've been talking about this mandate, they, they did not say definitely 10 domains next year. You know, right now we're only doing two. Um, and they said, well, that's being discussed. But, you know, um, I definitely think that we need to continue to, to advocate. It's just that we have to be careful because we can't jeopardize that money right now. That money is our paraprofessionals and we need them. But I think that some of the requirements within that grant absolutely could and should be questioned. Mm -hmm. We are not the only urban district questioning it. Uh, last year, uh, we had a presentation by the DESE on this, and there were other districts that were farther along right. than we were, and we're already pushing back on you know, a number of these requirements. You know, our concern again is six hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars um, supporting our kindergarten classrooms, but it's certainly a discussion as uh, Deputy Superintendent Barry said, we'll continue to have that with Kim Gibson and our BEA. We'll continue to support our teachers who need to do exactly what we need them to do, which is instruction of our kindergarten children. As I said, we have large class sizes. Um, another concern that we have, and I have to throw this out there, and it's always about the budget. If you remember one of the priorities last year coming in, I talked about it interviewing, I talked about it during transition, I talked about it during entry uh, and budget season, was uh, we do not have an early childhood coordinator. So again, we're, we're bringing in, you know, uh, Deputy Superintendent Barry, uh, Julian Andrade, our reading instructor, and, and again, we, we need an early childhood coordinator to be dealing not just with these kindergarten issues, but also looking at our preschoolers, looking at collaborations. I spent uh, a number of hours the other day with Joni Block, who actually serves on the early childhood board, uh, which is a real plus for Brockton. And you know, th these are some things that we have, we, we know that we need to address this. One of the most important things is, is certainly early literacy for children, uh, early opportunities for not every family can afford preschool. These are things that are coming at us and are really important to our success as a district. But there are opportunities for us to push back when it is taking us away from that very work that we need to do. So you know, we're not quiet about this, we'll continue to, to work. Uh, I thank uh, Kim and the BEA for working collaboratively at this point in time in what we can do with our little bit, right. bit of, excuse me, of pushback. And I do have to ask one question. When we had that meeting, one of the things that really resonated with me, when you talk about the teachers entering these ratings, the data, how many clicks did we come up <laughs> with? I, I mean, it was, it was over a thousand. I mean, think about, you know, being at a computer oh, entering just ridiculous. information. Yeah. I'm not sure we have the exact number, right. but and, the, and that and that's just two domains, and so s make that scale to ten. This is a this is a concern, and I mean I definitely we are going to have to continue to have conversations about how we support teachers in in complying with this mandate, and we'll and we'll do the best we can. I don't want teachers taking it home on 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 the weekends, and I don't want teachers doing that in the corner while the kids should be learning from them. I mean, we're talking about kids who who need that face time with their teachers, and teachers do an excellent job. Um, sometimes the focus is on the measure as opposed to the actual instruction, and this is really one of those cases. 
Well, I was going to bring it up under um, items to refer to subcommittee. However, since it's the topic of the moment, um, this is something I think the school committee needs to be briefed on in the curriculum subcommittee. So we will schedule one, get an update from both administration. I would invite um, the BEA to attend. I even see my friend Jackie McDonough here, so I would invite Jackie to come from the MTA's perspective. Hi, Jackie. Um, <laughs> so um, that way we can get up to speed on what's going on because, uh, to be quite honest with you, this was really the first time I had heard that there is this type of an issue. Um, and then we can see, you know, get educated as a committee, and then if there's something proactive that we can do in terms of advocating or letter writing or what have you, um, you know, if it's hindering our, our teaching and learning, if it's hindering an, an, an obstacle for our kindergarten students, um, I mean, this is what this body is meant to be, basically to advocate um, on behalf of our district. So um, I don't know what we're going to do just yet, but I think we need to assess what is going on, what um, obstacles are now in place that do not make sense for our district and our students and then take whatever appropriate action we deem as a body we should take. So we'll schedule something for curriculum sub. We'll figure out, I'll schedule with Wander and then we'll check with everyone on what's available in terms of nights or days. Ozzy. Last night I was at the group and one of the things I brought up was um, the one size fits all which just kind of fits into where programs that come down, whether it be from the federal or state people, when they present the programs to us, it's kind of across the board to all school systems within the state or you know, to the district as a whole where it doesn't really fit all, yet that's what we have to deal with. And at some point, maybe we need to go back, and I think you're talking about this in a way, to point that out, that urban are different from suburban and from rural. Um, there are some differences some real differences and by putting down programs across the board for everybody to fit as you brought up if if we've gone through these steps already why report them again why do we right. you know have to do that if we can show these are things that we have done and that's what I was trying to bring back to that particular group that one size fit all fits all does not work across the board they have to recognize that and all that does is is take up our time mm -hmm. and it takes away from the number one thing that we want is that's the children right. And it is. I mean, it's a blanket mandate. And I think the districts who do not have assessment measures in place are finding value. Um, that just simply is not Brockton. So, yeah. so appreciate some way what you're for, saying. for us to bring that back up the line so that they maybe can understand that. Because a lot of the times the folks involved may not understand that. And once they do, maybe we can say, all right, yeah, we see the point. We can do this at this level, where, however you fit, wherever you fit you know, as a, as a district, and so many districts or what have you, and this would be across the country, not just for us, so. Right. So we're, we're, we're doing two domains now instead of 10. Right. Um, so is there any indication that we're gonna have to do more subsequent years? Yes. Well, as I said, the, the, the plan was to do all 10 next year, um, yeah. but, but Early education and care is backing off on that a little bit, but we don't have anything in writing. So, I, you know, I think that the advocacy that we need to continue to do is important. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the 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 plan was to implement all ten next year, and given the constraints with two, I, I just don't know how we bring it. Um, yeah, I mean, in reading this, I mean, there's 38 objectives mm -hmm. organized into nine different areas of development, um, it, it, and the, the objectives are. are mind-boggling the amount of data that, that, mm -hmm. a, that a teacher has to put in, eating and drinking, toileting, dressing, personal safety. Comments, evidence. I mean, just into, that's objective one. Mm -hmm. I, I just can't imagine if a teacher has 25 kids in a classroom, you're not talking a few clicks, you're talking thousands right. and thousands of clicks. I mean, I don't do thousands of clicks in a day and I work on a computer and I don't interact with people. Uh, so how does, a, how does a teacher teach? if they're spending most of their time sitting on a computer. It's, it's concerning. <laughs> I, I'm concerned that a teacher's time is just being consumed by this. I, I know we're, we're kind of stuck with mandates and, and, and you know, we, we, we took that, but anything we can do to help mitigate some of the, the time these teachers are spending, I mean, this, 
this to me is just yeah, uh, it's it's a lot of data, and I am concerned too about where the. I mean, we're not taking photos and videos, but we are capturing data, and we have to be very cognizant of mm -hmm. how we're storing that data, where that data is being used, who's getting that data, are they requiring us to deliver that data to them? I mean, yeah. I don't want my kids' toileting uh, process being you know, given to the state or the federal government. I, I, I just, maybe that's just me. I don't think it's their business. Um, but I, I would encourage anything we can do to help fix this a little bit for, for our teachers. Patty? Um, I think that one of the, the concerns I, I have in general with accepting grants is that whoever's holding the purse strings has a lot to say mm -hmm. about how this, the monies are spent in, mm -hmm. in like, um, like you said, it's a blanket approach for very different districts to implement this type of uh, funding in and, and these um, mandates. Um, and I think we just have to be cognizant of that when right. we accept these grants, but how can we walk away from $600,000? And they know that. Um, so I agree that we do need to continue to advocate um, I do have a question on the assessments, though. Mm -hmm. um, we have our own in-house assessments that we do now. Yes, we do. Is there, have, have you thought about possibly replacing some of our assessments with what's required here so we're not doing so much duplication? If we are required to do these assessments as part of the grant, is there value in some of these assessments that we can replace some of what we're doing? Um, the only concern that I would have is that the assessments that we have are, are aligned. Um, these assessments in Teaching Strategies Gold are, are not aligned. Mm -hmm. And so it would just be something that I would want to be careful of. Right. Um, you know, the, the danger here is that <coughs> implementing Teaching Strategies Gold will cause some people to say, well, we have all these other assessments too. I, I, I feel like the shame would be is if we had to... Um, take out some of those assessments to make a more manageable situation for this assessment. Right. Whereas I think what we probably need to do, the conversation really needs to be more about are we finding value in TSG or, or, or were we okay without it? And, and I, I really think that in a lot of ways we were. Okay. Yeah. I tend to agree with that. But can we be okay without the funding? No. <laughs> yeah. That's the that's the six hundred thousand right. dollar question. Mm -hmm. So yeah, okay. We'll see. Have to see what we can do. I think uh, this curriculum subcommittee meeting is is the proper way to vet it out. We're getting very good at advocacy. Yeah. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Liz. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Liz. Um, next item, Madam Superintendent, district um, update. Let me just do a little bit of the district update. Um, I just saw Lieutenant Mills leave. I wish he didn't. I wanted to congratulate our first school police officers, Officer Hancock and Officer Smith. Officer Smith came into my office and he is so excited about the Huntington School great graduation for the fifth graders that they had. Um, it happened to work, of course, into your schedule, but the kids loved it. They received their certificates. All lessons were completed. I know they're going to another class at the Huntington. We'll continue to expand that in the district. And don't forget, our school police went through uh, the process a year ago on how to teach great. Um, and they were looking to get into a couple of classrooms, get their feet wet, and they just did a fabulous job. And again, it's, it's a, a connection with the students. Um, it's, it's great for our students to see our, our police officers as teachers, as supporters, and dealing with some of the issues that they'll face. Uh, and I'll remind everybody, we'll continue to uh, unveil our great uh, through the middle school. Uh, and I think we'll certainly be very pleased with the results. Again, um, I want to also thank the school committee for all of the things that you're doing. I want to remind the public that on October 25th, we had a huge showing with city councilors, our state delegation, our school committee members, even Senator Edward Markey ended up joining us at the Huntington School, which was the end of our facility tour. And it really, I think, was an eye-opener, not for the school committee, that, which pretty much knows your building and knows what we're dealing with, but to have, have all the elected officials there uh, was great for the district as we start to talk about uh, planning for our facilities master plan and our short-term goals. 
Um, we will have also, I want to remind everybody that we have a legislative delegation dinner coming up on November 25th. We're going to be talking again about advocacy and making sure that we are talking about those very areas that we need our legislative delegation. We certainly need our city council as we start to talk about budget. There are items here such as Chapter 70 Foundation budget. I know Aldo Petronio last night was out in Danvers, one of the first public hearings about Chapter 70 funding. I thank him for doing that. We'll continue to make sure that we have people at all of these hearings statewide. Um, and one of the things we'll be talking about again on the 25th during our legislative dinner. I'm not sure where the conversation will go because I want to remind everybody that again in the morning of November 25th at 8.30 during the uh, Board of Education meeting will be the vote on the waiver that is being requested by the charter school. I was never more proud of our district that back on November 5th, which with, I want to say, what did we have, five days notice, six days notice? Uh, that we got to present during a public hearing from 5 to 7. I want to thank, first of all, our leadership team, um, Ethan, Jocelyn, Sal, for sitting there and putting together not only a lot of our comments, but also putting together our position paper. Uh, we worked with our uh, attorney from Murphy, Hesse, Tumi, and Lane, Sarah Catignani. Our school committee members, Mr. Minicello, represented the school committee exceptionally well. Andy, thank you. And Ray, thank you for being able to be there. I know your work schedules allow you to kind of sneak into town during that time. You were well represented. I was proud of our union president who did an excellent job, the support from the MTA, but the most proud I was was of the teachers that spoke. And the teachers spoke not just from the heart, they spoke about the instruction for students. They talked about, again, there is not a need for a charter school not only in the Brockton Public Schools, but at this point here, because of what I mentioned to you back in early October, because of getting out of the lowest 10%, we are not a needy district that needs a charter school to come and save the day. We will continue to um, work uh, towards uh, making sure the message is loud and clear. We will have representation there on the 25th of November. Uh, again, I'm not sure which way the vote will go, but I, I, I again, couldn't be prouder of our district and our support. Um, Mr. Minicello, you want to talk a little bit about the charter? Um, well, I think we've been pretty clear in terms of whether our community needs, wants, has requested a charter, and, and the answer is no. Um, basically, it seems to me that the powers that be, you know, want to have a charter in Brockton for the sake of having a charter in Brockton. Um, and if you go clearly by the standard, the answer is quite simple, that the waiver shouldn't be granted. It's really not all that complicated to me. Um, so, you know, I'm anticipating that the DESC needs to follow the rules that are in place and the waiver should not be granted. If, in fact, they don't follow the rules, then we will take whatever action we deem appropriate at the time. Um, but again, I was very proud of, of our representation. I thought the teachers were phenomenal. They spoke from the heart. Um, their words were extremely on point. Um, and they were just, um, you could just tell why we have an incredible teaching staff here in the city of Brockton. Um, and I thought that um, Kim Gibson was phenomenal, um, did an excellent job. And I thought the you, Superintendent Smith, were, was, were phenomenal. Um, we're very fortunate in terms of what we have here in Brockton as a district. And um, that's, you know, that's what makes this city so special. And I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you the very next day representing you at the uh, MASC, MASS conference, uh, Ozzie and I uh, were there. We worked side by side with Fitchburg. Ozzie was out there with petitions, uh, with school committee members, you know, talking about the charter and there was a lot of support. There's a lot of people that really don't understand what we're dealing with. Um, I want to thank you, Ozzie. That was a great collaboration. Uh, and the other thing, though, too, is I want to make sure the public hears. We're all about innovation. We presently are working with the BEA. We're talking about innovation. We're talking about Horace Mann. You heard talk about an arts academy. You have choices for parents in our district. 
And whatever the vote is, we'll continue to provide those kind of choices, you know, for our families and for our community. But I can't thank you enough. Um, it was it was a solid effort on our part, and again, we'll be talking about it that evening at the legislative dinner. We'll be talking about advocacy and whatever our next steps are. That's that's my report. Great. Okay, um, items to refer to subcommittee. We already talked about one curriculum. Um, we um, I'd like to schedule a superintendent contract subcommittee. I believe um, we might have some time before our next school committee meeting. Um, I don't think it needs to be a long meeting. We could do it at 6.30. Um, uh, just a reminder that we have another um, joint meeting scheduled with the city council uh, December 3rd. Is that a Wednesday? I think that's a Wednesday. I think over at South this time. Uh, over at South at 6.30, yes, South. Mr. Thomas has arranged for that, as he does, and does a fine job. Um, any other, anyone else have a, a subcommittee meeting or something that we need to address? Policy or anything? We need to schedule one. We need to schedule Wait till after the yeah. first of the year at this okay. point. Yeah, okay. All right, uh, unfinished business? Sure. Um, because, and I'm only bringing these up now because we canceled the last meeting. Um, I saw a handful of folks out, but Halloween hallways at the high school. We were almost a almost a month removed from Halloween, but it was an awesome, awesome time. I brought my brand new daughter out in her little pig costume. Um, <laughs> She's cute. So you collected but, uh, the candy for her or for you? Uh, well, on her behalf. Yeah, I bet you did. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, a little pig nose on. No, but it was great. I mean, we got there probably an hour after it started, and there was a line out the door and around the corner. Um, the kids at the high school were awesome. Awesome. Um, I mean, I think, you know, at, at points in the night, the donuts they had for kids to decorate at the donut decorating station kind of ran out, and all of a sudden, you know, you jump to kids reading, high school kids reading other younger kids' stories and coloring sheets and painting pumpkins, and um, it was it was a really really fun time. Um, we brought our our babysitter who takes care of our daughter. Her kids came with us, and they had a blast. Um, it was really awesome. And then election day. Um, Folks from Brockton who vote in Brockton may have noticed this year, we had over 30 students working the polls. Um, so it was the first time we've been able to take advantage of that opportunity. John McGarry, our elections commissioner, has been working for a long time to try to engage young people from Bridgewater, from Stonehill, from the high school, and has just never been able to kind of figure it out. Um, I was able to work with him and Michelle Connors from the high school. Um, we actually had a lot of kids who, um, from the, uh, from the uh, medical interpreters program, um, current students, students who graduated last year because the opportunity was actually introduced at the end of last year. Um, they took a training at the beginning of September. Um, they got paid for the whole day to work at the polls. It was like 125 bucks, I think, to work for the whole day at the polls. Nice. And they worked in pairs at polling stations all over the city, many of them supporting local residents with interpretation services and other things. I know there were two students at my polling place, and I think it's just an awesome thing. And hopefully something will be able to grow. Um, John McGarry indicated that he had over 60 spots available. We were able to get, I think, about 30, 38 students this year. Um, so hopefully their experience will translate into um, something positive at the high school that'll create an opportunity for more kids and kind of our practice of giving that day off in the pub Brockton Public Schools for safety and other issues also kind of makes it easy for them to be able to do that. It may be easier than it has been in the past. and so. Um, just a really awesome thing, I think, um, and something that I was really happy to see happen. The poll workers, when I was at the Hancock School, which is my polling place, were, when I came up to, to vote, they were so excited to remind me that our students were sitting there, but they loved it. And, and many of these people are retired people. They were thrilled to have the young people by their sides, and I'm sure they were used uh, many times over. So I thought it was great. Yeah, awesome. Ray? Just wanted to give the public a a reminder that the 29th is the holiday parade in the city of Brockton. It starts at 1, and a lot of our schools will be very well represented. Um, I know the Angelo School is preparing uh, a big surprise, so um, come, enjoy. 
Uh, Dave Gorman is also going to do his um, Christmas extravaganza, Jingle Bell. the Jingle Bell Run again. Um, so people should look for that. Uh, he does a, a, a great job every year. Uh, he challenged me to get a bunch of school committee people to come. Uh, <laughs> I told him I would definitely... To run? To run, to walk, whatever oh, you'd like walk. to do. Um, you have to dress up, too. Yeah, well, I Elves, yeah, they, Santa. Oh, yeah. Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> the Grinch. We'll leave that for Andy. He's the Grinch. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, that's always a great event. So um, Dave invited everyone and invites everyone out there to participate in the Jingle Bell Run this year. Uh, anything else? No? Okay. Uh, new business? Did you want to talk about uh, facilities planning team report? Or? Do we have Deputy to hear from Superintendent Mr. Thomas? Thomas? Do we have to hear from Mr. Thomas tonight? He's had a rough I thought day. We, I thought we were getting out, of, getting out of listening to Mr. Thomas. His dog set off the fire alarm uh, today, so he's had a rough day. I warned him about that dog. Yeah, anybody want a dog? <laughs> <laughs> Why uh, Yes. <laughs> so I just want to report on the facilities uh, planning team. Uh, we've met uh, twice already. Um, this committee is a, a committee for the short term that is looking at our facility needs. Also, f um, f for uh, some of our programs are placed. Um, we're working with you know pretty much all the school committee members have been coming, but it's it's a it's an arm of this facility subcommittee. We have principals on board. Um, Deputy Superintendent Superintendent Liz Barry. We have um, um, executive directors um, Cliff Murray, June Saber, uh, Mr. Petronio, principals across the district, and also members from the Parent Information Center. So we're looking at where programs are located. Um, we know that the need in Brockton is for a new elementary school somewhere on the south side, but we know that is about a, at least a five-year uh, project. That's um, it takes about five years to build a new school when you first apply for it. So um, we know we need to find some classroom space, especially in the south zone. Um, so this committee is looking at that. We're also looking at um, how we transport students across the city f um, for different programs that they're in, either if they're special education or um, in bilingual classes and SEI programs. We need to look at where th those programs are in does it make sense to continue to bus kids in, in, into certain schools? So um, we've only had two meetings. Um, there's been nothing in detail discussed as far as what we would move. Obviously, if, if anything is ever discussed, um, then the stakeholders for any building would be um, represented. Kim um, Gibson is going to join us at the next meeting. Uh, these are all public meetings um, that are open to the public, and anybody uh, is welcome to attend. We have them here at the Unknown at 6.30. Our next meeting is December 8th, um, again at 6.30 here at the Unknown. Um, and you know anybody else that's with us on that committee can can jump in. But I think it's um, it will be a productive group. Um, we do need to make some decisions for next year to open up some classroom space, especially especially at the elementary school level. And um, before, and it's important to note before we can apply for a new school with the MSBA, which provides 80% reimbursement for a school to Brockton, you have to show that you're using all your buildings to their full capacity, and that's something we're, we are also looking at. So. Um, again, so it's it's been going well, but you know, as, as the um, as we get into the new year, we'll probably end up having at least two meetings a month, maybe sometimes three, as we move closer to the spring. So, um, anybody else, anybody else that's been on those uh, at those meetings, feel free to jump in. <laughs> Good. Good. Thomas, thanks. Okay. Uh, I don't believe anyone needs to go into executive session for anything, so we will pass over that. Is there anything else for anyone? Okay, wonderful. Uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. All right, thank you for attending. All in favor? We are adjourned.